Hey everybody, I'm Eric Erlock, and this is another talk on Chinese philosophy and another short chapter from the Book of Rights, The Doctrine of the Mean. Just did a short video on the Great Learning, which I explained uh, through that video how Confucius probably did not write that himself, but it is unclear how much Confucius did or did not write the Book of, of Rights himself, or whether or not he compiled it from earlier sources, and sometimes the, auth uh, the authorship and authority is given to Confucius, sometimes to earlier authors he is simply passing along. So it is not clear how much this is or isn't Confucius, but it is decently clear something like it was pre-Confucius. So before getting into Confucius, it is good to get into the two short chapters of the Book of Rights that became very central to Confucians, studied a lot, were studied a lot by Confucius, and then became central to Neo-Confucianism, the Great Learning, which I've already talked about, and the Doctrine of the Mean, which is also translated as the Middle Way. And yes, this is a lot like the ethics of Buddhism, as well as Aristotle. Now, I like to do ethics and compare Confucius and Buddha and Aristotle's ethics all together. There's lots of talks I give about all of that, and I mention that very briefly here, and that's it. Um, and then if you want more about the Middle Way and Aristotle or the Buddha, I've got a lot on that. But this is, and I haven't done Confucius yet in these longer lecture talks, before we get into Confucius, we're going to get into how he is into the doctrine of the mean, the middle way, and doing something like between excess and lack as virtue between two vices, a la Aristotle, which is very much Buddhism as well, and gets into a lot of issues we will simply leave to tons and tons of other chats. I do love all of these little chats. A little song, a little dance, a little seltzer down the pants. So with all of that, and the most sacred of Chinese classics, and my silly jokes, uh, that you have the doctrine of the mean, the even keel of human thought, and whether or not we all get keel-hauled with it on the regular. So the doctrine of the mean is the idea that of moderation. Not practicing too much, not practicing too little, something like baby bear theory, yes? Not too much papa bear, not too much mama bear, baby bear. So, Confucius in the Analects says, I don't know of anyone who would leave a room without using the door. It's possible he did not know of the Incredible Hulk or the Kool-Aid dude. So, he wonders aloud, why would people walk outside the middle way? And this is the doctrine of the mean. Why would they walk outside the middle balance way and be like, oh yeah, you know, and like smash through a wall? That doesn't seem convenient at all. Um, that seems rather silly pants. Uh, that seems like wasting a bunch of your energy for the Taoists. It also doesn't seem like expedient means for the Buddhists. And both uh, Buddhism and Taoism will join Confucius and Confucianism in being the three great schools of Chinese thought. Buddhism is a transplant uh, non-native from India. And the two major schools of Chinese thought native to China being Confucianism and Taoism. So the text of the Doctrine of the Mean says that the noble person, and Confucius is all about the noble person, and it is both a noble gentleman and a scholar, who's also just anybody who's awesome, like we use the word a gentleman today, oddly enough, uh, using a word that, as the text is here, a word for a noble, as in an aristocrat, but here just a noble is you as a, you know, you as a gentleman and a scholar. Now back to my job as English professor at NYU's, as in the show The Critic. So, a noble person embodies the course of the mean, the balance, not the mean, the rude, the, the you know, the midway, and I'll leave that to mathematicians to explain that in the average. The balance of extremes, while the crude person acts against the course of the mean. This is all very Taoist also, but is core Confucius as well. Acting out of balance and to the extreme. An old translation of the text I have says that the mean, lowercase man, acts against the course of the mean, uppercase, and it puts it nice and simply that way in English, which is needlessly confusing, but actually probably trying to pun on the simple language being very tricky. And a lot of times I try to simplify the language of these quotes, actually, as much as I can, not because I want to falsify the text, but because it is such simple language that is implying several meanings. Although the mean and the mean here, that's not in the original Chinese because they're not using that like that. Um, 
those like that. So the noble are cautious and thus stay balanced, while the crude are hasty and thus overact. As we, uh, it is very much, again, Taoism, Wu Wei, acting less to stay in accord with the way of things. Speaking of the sage king Shun, I've already mentioned him in the Hundred Schools talk, there was Shun, this is a longer quote, he was indeed truly wise. Shun loved to question others and to study their words, though they might be shallow. He concealed what was bad in them and displayed what was good. He took hold of their two extremes, determined the mean, and employed it in his government of the people. It was by this that he was shun. The superior person, quote, cultivates a friendly harmony without being weak, end quote. That's balance. It's very Aristotle. You want to be strong. You don't want to be overly strong. You don't want to be a coward. You want to be middle way. That's strength. Strength is not over strength. It's not weakness. It is balance strength, being weak and bendable enough. Very Taoism. Very thinking all over the world plenty, but also very Confucianism. Even though Confucius is a lot more dogmatic and conservative than the Taoists, I would say, although those words are odd, again, calling it conservative to split up the more dogmatic, um, and yet is very relativistic and somewhat uh, both sides of the elephant, about the ethics here. And a little bit fluid. Uh, you find here, just like with the great learning before that there is the open investigation of things is actually the strength of the knowledge and of the heart. So you actually have something here, a little bit Upanishadic, where there is something that the, the fluid way is actually the strength of the strength and the middle way. That is both Confucian and Taoist, although those are very different philosophies, the two great different philosophies of China, native to China. Joined by Buddhism, which actually has very similar ethics all over it and in it later which could not have been seen as a coincidence by the Confucians, Taoists, and Buddhists of China. It is associated, uh, this is all associated with the principle of reciprocity in Confucianism, the golden rule, the old golden rule. Uh, not just he who has the gold makes the rules, which is the funny golden rule, which is too often true, unlike the golden rule, which is treat others the way you want to be treated. The Confucians debated about how we not only treat people the way we want to be treated, but balance that with not treating people the way you don't want to be treated. People have, I think, foolishly gotten into arguments over whether Jesus or Confucius believed in the positive or negative golden rule. Saying it either way could imply either way, and then you also could have thinkers be more into one than the other proactive. This gets very Bentham Mill. I won't get into all of that. Do you want the state to be minimalistic, or do you want them to be proactive? I won't do all that here. That's very ethics and a lot of other philosophy. But how we treat others is how we want to be treated, whether or not that's positive or negative. And the Neo-Confucians debated this in specific terms as two sides of the coin, because they have all the tools here to do that. Do I proactively make you the Soviet omelet or do I leave you alone to make your own breakfast and I then occasionally with capitalism let everybody, you know, maybe starve a bit? Um, well, how proactive or in your face or laissez-faire do you want the state actually does avoiding all politics here and for my purposes that... That is something going on here in this Chinese philosophy and then you find that in the works of Plato and Aristotle and lots of folks. So... What you do find is this is then extended in Confucian thought to the five relationships, which are very basic to Confucian thought early on in Confucianism. This is like a lot of stuff. Mencius actually and others after Confucius kind of put it into a system. And Confucius may or may not have known these are the five. But we should treat in all of the five very traditional husband rules wife, which is not I'm in Berkeley town as a lefty lefty person. That's not exactly tradition out here. And of course, there's a lot of talk back and forth in the left and the right about these things, avoiding politics yet again, but talking about all of these angles is foolishly enough fools all over the place. Then you, you would have the five relationships. However, you rule people or not your parents over children, uh, boss over workers, that you should treat those above as you would have those beneath you be treated and vice versa. That if you're above, remember how you want superiors to treat you, so treat your inferiors the way you'd have your superiors treat you. And they detail all this out, and that's amazing, of course. And detailing more of that out is a whole lot of awesome ethics. For Neo-Confucians onwards in China. We should refrain from both treating those beneath us with contempt as well as court favor. Don't unnecessarily butter, you know, butter up brown nose those above us. The noble quietly work on their situation while the crude look for lucky breaks, the, tel the text tells us. Which is very Confucius to say, in a good society you want to be prosperous, in a bad society you actually don't want to be because that means you're, br you're brown nosing and uh, holding ill court, let's call it. 
But if the nobles should, the truly noble, not the aristocrats, but the truly noble, like the aristocrats, should be ideally, they would work away quietly whether or not they get promoted by the good or not promoted by the bad, while the crude and the awful would just look for the luckiest break in whatever era they're in, just talk like whomever, and not do the noble noble balanced thing that would be the harder path. Here I am speaking beyond all politics and purposefully. I know people would read politics into this, but I do truly mean, and I teach all of this stuff as if this is noble for Confucius, and I think he was a lot more conservative than I am, you know, in Berkeley today. So given all of that, and I do like Taoism, I already got my Taoist talks up, I rant and rave about all sorts of things in the Taoist talks, so you can figure out plenty about me. But in this sort of thing, whether or not you like or dislike politics, and it's plenty popular for the right and the, the left to dislike altogether. If you're interested, you dislike politics and the elites, right? Okay. So whether or not we're conspiratorial about it. So the noble, it's again, if you're good, well, quietly be patient and awesome. It's good advice for everybody if you don't like the powers that be, you know, because you don't want to get a lucky break with the powers that be. You're not trying to get rich quick. You are trying to be solid. Maybe that's financial. Maybe that's things, you know, more, uh, more difficult to earn than money, you know, depending on where you're living. So, or how you're living, but yeah, that no uh, balance in character and strength is really the longer battle to fight regardless of one's politics or nobility or wealth or what have you is very good Confucian solid teaching to teach everybody. Another metaphor used in the text is the noble archer who misses the target. And then instead of blaming somebody else. Hey, somebody cough. That guy, jerk. You know, it's a little happy Gilmore. They've been celebrating the anniversary of that recently. I remember laughing, uh, go to your home. And I actually do joke with Taoism, go to your home, you know, because the, what Abby Gilmore does in there is a bit meditative, bit Taoist Buddhistic in ways as an American kind of golfer. And it is a little bit, go to your home. And you yell, you know, it's like, go do, do what's nobly the way stupid archer. Phrasing. The, another metaphor, again, here, the noble archer misses the target and examines themselves rather than points and blames others. I mentioned in the Lietza that uh, Lietza says, uh, non Guoza next door, he's a real genius. And he goes back and that guy's like, hey, you weak guy, you in the crowd, who's the dumbest guy? You're a jerk, you're a jerk, you're a jerk. And he comes back out and he's like, that guy knows how to really say something. Because, of course, he's almost doing what's happening is the sage is actually doing the least noble archer routine on purpose. He's being absurdly opposite the noble archer because he's like, ah, uh, like, and that he doesn't care what we think about him. He's just polishing his axe and doing his routine of being a jerk. And uh, Lietz is like, that guy's really amazing because he's meaning that like he's acting a fool on purpose to show us all a jerk and he doesn't care is actually the Taoistic irony, you know, interestingly there is that he's not trying to be purposely hypocritical. He's trying to be like, I'm showing you a jerk. I'm a jerk. Hey, look at this. And then he just doesn't ever break the joke. Ayo, you know, and so it's like, wow, that guy's the least noble archer because he's not. He's examining the least. That guy coughed, the weakest in your party. That guy, that guy. And it's like, instead of being like, I examine yourself, I miss the shot. What's, what must I do of myself? So psychology experiments actually talk about this as a very interesting thing that's worthwhile terms to know of psychology called internal and external attribution. Now, I imagine those could be called different things. I learned it as that. I know textbooks change ever much as in uh, with Ned Flanders' parent, beatnik parents, boom, 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 bap, and The Simpsons as the psychiatrist is like, please get down from that shelf, rebellious child. Most of those books haven't been discredited yet. But as uh, the ever-evolving, you know, uh, terms of psychology, and I don't know if these are entirely internally or externally consistent, internal attribution is, and I believe they are current terms, when you say, I did something, whether it's good or bad, external is, oh, that was the situation. And what they do find, and I do put this in ethics very centrally, so I'm happy to explain internal and external attribution here, very simply, is what psychologists have found is, and I do love, the Egyptians say, don't be the jerk. You know that guy. They're blamed for everything. If jerkness and goodness is something weirdly we live in human cultures all over the place, not in a dogma or a set of rules, but in who's a good or bad character, which is what the Confucians and Taoists are wrestling with. And I do like to teach loosely, maybe there's good and bad human character we talk about in human societies as human folk psychology. If you buy into anything of that, and there's kind of general good and bad human character, kind of, without me policing anything on that, what you can learn from Confucianism and a lot of Taoism, and especially Confucius is amazing and Confucianism on this point, very Jesus also very much the kind of thing where in the 15 and 1600s Europeans got to China they were like wow Confucius sounds like Jesus we got to use that angle like heck whether or not it's the devil 
that if you say examine your own, if you're reaching into somebody, Jesus says, of course, with the parable, it's like you're reaching into somebody's own face. Why don't you clear out your own eyes? Squeaky, squeaky, squeak. Before you go reaching into somebody's own mug, mugsy. That what you find in a lot of these ethical teachings, why people like Buddha and Confucius and Jesus, very much has to do with flipping the script and flipping people's vision back on themselves and getting them to flip it back and forth. Yes, loosely speaking of that as ye old golden rule, what the noble archer example from this text that then becomes central to Confucius and Confucianism is talking about is that what psychologists note, which I haven't told you yet, is that when we are in competition with others and they ask people, they have people play games, Unknowing to the people a lot of times, the games don't actually, uh, the people don't know, don't trust psychology experiments, whether or not you're a psychology major, who has to do them? Yes, in order to get credit at a university, major university doing research. But while you're in there trying to figure out what rat maze you're trapped in, you know, they are taking away all the variables so you can't tell anything. So what they do is they have people sit down, play games, and then whether or not they win the games or they lose, which could be just all a setup. Imagine people all playing CSGO, and then you don't know whether or not you're skilled or there's wall hacks or not or anything crazy like that. And talking to the, you know, all the young people with the internet. They then ask people when you do a good or bad in a game, did you win because you, or did you win because of the situation? Or did they win because of them? Or did they win because of the situation? What do you think we find in good and bad character that people comment on that they find wise advice the world over? Which is nice, good folk, valuable ethics and psychology, right? Well, what Jesus and Confucius are talking about, like the Buddha and others, which is really solid, like, wow, deep, deep ethics, and I don't make it all dogmatic or particular to this or that culture. But what you find is human beings exchange texts and talk about talk is that jerks, if they win, they say, that was me, I'm most amazing. If they lose, they're like, that was the situation. Internal, I'm good. External, oh, when I lose, it's the lighting in here, I didn't have my coffee. Although that's rather internal, you know, for a little while. If you are looking at somebody else who's winning at a game you just lost, you're like, what is the situation, you know, that you would, the magnetism switches in the head, of course. Wittgenstein does say, we don't watch our own hands to make sure they're not involved in evil, unless you're on bad, dro uh, you know, and you're on, unless you're on las drogas, uh, mios. So, you're not really watching, you know, trying to freak out, you know, in, uh, you're not trying to watch yourself the way you watch others. So, you'd be trying to stack the game for yourself, crude breaks not being noble and balanced in character. And if you're not balanced in character and you're looking for crude breaks, then you'd be looking to just in the situation, well, I did good because of me. Well, I don't get enough credit. I'm good because of me. The situation was bad when I lose, but for somebody else, you would use the opposite strategy to draw more apples and gold your way. Yes, you would with crude character and with mean, rough-edged character, not properly baby bear balanced, is you would be too aggressive, Papa Bear, too weak, Mama Bear, and you wouldn't be properly balanced, Baby Bear, who hopefully grows up to be a proper balanced baby. Um, let's not assume gender here, as it's all intertwined with our emotions in both. You know, plenty, no matter who you are, with the strength and the with the active and the passive and all of these male-female forces and intertwined in the yin and the yang for the ancient Chinese systems. With all of that, if the enemy, of course, is we blame the enemy, that person's a jerk, or they had better lighting and coffee, then what we do is you actually, in many teachings of Confucianism and Taoism, which I will let you watch at your leisure, I have not yet done the Confucius, Mencius, and Sun Tzu, but there's many good teachings that show this. If you want to be a really amazing person, the Taoist metaphor that uh, not only do they use this noble archer much in the Taoist stories, but that you would also have something like in the way that I paraphrase it, that if you're really the noblest of archer and if you're the noblest of archers, archer, and you, somebody shows which archer in the show is not the noblest of people. He's a big jerk and always cutting things his way like a narcissistic, uh, well, like a leader or some kind that if somebody shows up and they're like second uh, person, a jerk would try to sabotage the equipment of somebody else. And it would be a really good setup in an obvious anime plot, you know, all over the place, if somebody who's a jerk sabotages the equipment of somebody else because they want to win and get a crude break. But if the noble archer sees somebody's equipment sabotaged, and if that person is really in it to long-term win, not get the crude break, they would lend their best bow that they're most practiced on to, if it's good for them, if not, oh, you don't want this one? Okay, how about the other one? 
you would lend the best equipment you have for that person to that person and be like, no, let me give you my running shoes. I'll run barefoot, as I saw a crazy person do uh, the other day online here in a race. It's like, yeah, no, you would run barefoot and give the other person your running shoes if you are the most amazing of anime characters in the plot twist to the twist. What a twist, because you're reversing, you're flipping the script. You're in there for the long haul. And I do think we do have human minds that click into patterns like that, most basically such that when Confucius and Jesus do tell people, well, switch it around like that, and Jesus is hanging out with, say, lepers and prostitutes and such, if you make the thing harder for you and it's always human, then you're flipping it around and you're slowly developing. I think this also has to do with slow development is hidden in here also. If you slowly trust that reversing and flipping the script makes you powerful and balanced then nobody can really throw you, is very much the Confucian and Taoist idea. And that is what the Taoists and then Zen, I do argue, show you a lot, and I have many videos about that. They are looking to see how shaken you are and what makes you tense, and if you are tense for one moment because they say something weird, they got you, you know? They know exactly which way your mind went, and we all do if we're paying attention because it's very natural and of the simple mind that we've had for a very long time. So no matter how noble or educated we are, we all are, I would say, definitely if you look at tribal people on YouTube, etc., and much love and humanity to everyone, you can see tribal people are knocking ridicule, as the anthropologists and psychologists tell us, is a human tool, where if Steve catches a big, uh, big uh, elk and set of antlers, he's like, ha-ha, people are like, that's not that great of a deer, Steve. <laughs> because ridicule and ridiculing the big guy in the community and being like taking him down a peg is human, you know? So with all of that intertwined, of course, and me always taking sort of the general, we have general human kind of mind culture with all sorts of exceptions and overlap and everything open, you would find the world's cultures being into the ye old golden rule and also finding this noble archer teacher teaching something awesome in that instead of examining others, when you commit fault, examine yourself. Or when others are, uh, as Confucius flips it, full around, when others screw up, examine yourself. When others are win, try to be better, be better as uh, if your enemy wins, it's a Hunter S. Thompson is like, who's on Las Drogas, is like he loses in Las Vegas with lots of lights in the air. And he's like, no, learn to enjoy losing. It's the Johnny Depp doing the, uh, yes, all of that. Rather circular. So if you are, if you enjoy losing and if you learn from losing, I have admired many people of many walks of life, not entirely mine, who enjoy losing, learn from losing slowly. If you can afford it in this economy, learn to losing slow is actually making uh, good. It's also worth saying I'm just doing Nietzsche talks. Nietzsche says don't trust religion, science, politics, art, anything. And I say, well, I would trust vaccines, you know, and not be the conspiracy theorist. Why don't you need to trust anything, even if there's the most solid of systems? Because you're making yourself solid and learning to trust and distrust humanity and learning to be too active, the papa bear, too uh, weak uh, and loving the mama bear, but being balanced like the Taoist male and female yin yang baby bear. So with all of that, we are balancing the strong and the weak, the male and the female, the noble and the mean in order to be the mean and the doctrine and to take and be the balance ourselves. Very much the plumb bob for the Egyptians with the Anubis and the heart and the feather for the Egyptians long before this, actually. So with all that in my rant here in this shorter video a bit, it is a very core teaching. Again, I do think that this sort of thing is centrally important as far as what we can glean from thousands of years of human thought in several cultures, which is the simple and the stupid, as Edgar Allan Poe knew, and I will do his detective stories and what I find most amazing and Taoist and brilliant in there. Much love and happiness. Try to be the mean and not be so mean. You mean, wonderful, glor inglorious bastards. And I will see you and even talk to you if you want. If I ever see you.